Was it? Hello, thanks very much. Um, so I was lucky enough a few years ago um, to be involved in the production of um, a television series uh, called Tribe, which was made here in Cardiff by uh, BBC Wales um, and led by a fantastic inspirational character called um, Sam Organ. Um, now, Tribe looked at the lives of uh, remote indigenous peoples around the world and sort of explored the way that their lives were changing as the forces of you know, globalization sort of penetrated every corner of the world. And Tribe um, broke new ground at the time in that it didn't film observationally as these films normally would have been made, but it, it took a presenter from this country and sort of launched him into their world and encouraged him to participate in their lives for a period of a month. So he would hunt and eat what they ate and, um, and just you know, generally live the life of, of the tribe. And um, it seemed like, you know, at the time, it's sort of it's obvious now where you pitch Lindsay Lohan into, into remote communities and see how she gets on. But at the time, it was sort of, um, you know, it seemed like a, a new idea. Um, and the guy that we chose to do this was uh, Bruce Parry, uh, and that's him on the left. Uh, and in Bruce, we had a sort of exceptional character. Um, he was a former Royal Marines officer. Um, a man with a sort of huge appetite for life um, would try anything once, at least once, um, and do so with humility and respect and with a smile on his face. And we asked him to do some pretty horrible things over the course of the uh, tribe, and it turned out he had a, a real extraordinary ability for eating the most disgusting stuff and, and not vomiting, um, which proves to be one of his, his sort of primary talents, really. Um, so we had uh, a commission to make six films, BBC Two, and we had a brilliant presenter. And um, we sort of realised that we didn't have much clue how to actually make this thing, and that they're quite hard to uh, to find remote indigenous peoples. Obviously, you can't email or call, and they're pretty, um, you know, quite rightly heavily protected by government agencies and by anthropologists who, frankly, thought what we were doing was was trivial and uh, crass. And they may well be right. Um, but also, um, lots of governments of these places where remote indigenous people live tend not to want film crews to visit uh, and to tell their stories, especially if um, those stories involve logging rights or mineral extraction or oil fields or hydroelectric powers, as, as they so often do. Um, so we had six frustrating months of not really going anywhere. Um, and being turned down by everywhere. And we started to realize that we we're going to have to go to quite a lot of places um, illegally uh, without the government's permission. So uh, the first place, or one of the first places we went to was this place here, West Papua, which is uh, in Indonesia. It's the Indonesian part of New Guinea Island, and it used to be called um, Irian Jaya. And it is an extraordinary, extraordinary sort of breathtaking landscape, huge, huge mountains, deep river valleys, um, you know, sort of extreme geography. Um, and it looks empty, but of course it's not empty at all. It's, you know, it's full of, of people, of extraordinary people. And because of the geography, uh, it's full of people that have had very little or, or, or no contact with the outside world at all. Um, and so we had to go in undercover, although I didn't go. Uh, the, the crew had to go in undercover. So uh, this is the crew having done the BBC's health and safety disguised as indigenous peoples course, uh, and I think you agree, blending in very, very successfully. Um, and they were going to visit people called the Kombai, who are sort of remote forest hunter-gatherers um, that live deep in this sort of swamp forest in the middle of New Guinea. And um, until quite recently, if not to this day, uh, practice um, cannibalism. And so the point of our film was to go there and see you know, how could something that's sort of abhorrent in our world function in theirs? And of course, they turn out to be, you know, the nicest bunch of people you could ever meet. Um, and in this next clip that's coming up now, um, they're showing Bruce uh, a little bit about jungle hygiene. Oh, he's, he's already left. <laughs> 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 That's a little 
different grub they use for ear cream. It's one of my favourite clips from uh, all the tribes that we made because it shows sort of what we were trying to do, which was, you know, learn through experience these lives that are sort of so different to ours, but they're exactly the same as well, and they just they had such a good time. But it also says an awful lot about the combine, um, in that so these people have have nothing; they owned absolutely nothing that wasn't derived from the forest around them. So their food, their clothing, their shelter, their tools, everything came from probably within a 10 mile radius of where they lived, um, which is, compared to our world is sort of extraordinary really, where we have no idea where any of our stuff comes from anymore. Um, they live in these beautiful tree houses, um, high up in the canopy, because uh, it's cooler and it's above mosquitoes and because uh, they've got quite a lot of enemies and other tribes and there's sort of quite a lot of intertribal warfare goes on. Um, they hunt in the forest, they hunt pigs and um, tree kangaroos and they eat sago grubs and um, they live incredibly well. Um, they have a lot of free time. Forest-based hunter-gatherers, they reckon, work three hours a day. The rest of the time they sort of hang out and smoke a lot and, you know, tell stories, play with their kids, sleep. It's sort of, it's a, it's a good life and it's something we could learn from. Um, they thought that our crew was absurd in big jungle boots with, you know, kit all over them and GPS units, hydration sacks. And they sort of saw us as um, these fat, white, swollen, um, useless children and would sort of ask, you know, what sort of rubbish jungle do you come from? Because you're so crap at everything and would have to sort of help us through the jungle, help, help the crew through the jungle, as they were, you know, dressed in a penis gourd and a smile, and um, barefoot. And so, uh, an, an amazing, amazing bunch of people. Um, and we sort of saw this everywhere we went, with every hunter-gatherer community, really, that they would share childcare, um, the kids would be in nets on their mother's backs, they would take their kids to the fields with them to work, um, and, they lived in multi-generational households, so granny and granddad lived there as well and helped look after the kids. And I thought, as a, you know, as a father of three, it sort of looks pretty good in many ways. And I think there's an awful lot we can learn from, from that. Um, you see how little they are. Bruce is only like that big, so. <laughs> so, uh, the first series of Tribe did pretty well, and the BBC asked us to do another series immediately, and um, we decided to go to the Omo Valley, which is in uh, southern Ethiopia, uh, and sort of just north of Lake Turkana in Kenya. And um, it's sort of, uh, we, we'd been there in series one to, to do a film with the, the Suri people, and we wanted to go back again to look at how the sort of tribal situation locks together. There's all these amazing sort of flamboyant tribes down there that uh, make a living in this sort of very arid Ethiopian badlands, um, herding cattle and with some sort of shifting agriculture. Um, 
it's sort of a bit of a dangerous place in some ways in that uh, the only piece of technology that these tribes have taken from you know, the modern world is the AK-47, which has come over the border from um, Sudan. And so, um, and, you know, and they've all, they're involved in, in, in sort of intertribal conflict with each other as they, they battle over diminishing resources, essentially water and grazing rights for their cattle. Um, but they're an amazing bunch of people. And they're incredibly beautiful, and um, they adorn their bodies fantastically. And they've also sort of devised these incredible rituals um, to mark various passages within life. Um, one of which I'm about to show you now, which is Bruce taking part in uh, the coming of age ceremony of a young man of the Hamar tribe. And um, I warn you that it contains full frontal male nudity. So those of a nervous disposition should turn away now. Okay, so as you can imagine, we, we like filming that sort of stuff very much. Um, not only because, uh, you know, it puts Bruce at the sort of centre of the community. You know, tribes came from miles around to watch the white guy jump the cows. Um, <laughs> Bruce hated it, absolutely hated it. Uh, <laughs> we would have filmed a lot more initiation ceremonies, but most of them in, involve uh, circumcision with a very blunt, rusty knife. And so Bruce was more than usually circumspect. Uh, I think, you know, these rites of passage form, um, I think that they're very, very important things with all the tribal cultures that we visited. And it's something that we've lost in our society. I think that, you know, that guy, sorry, there's a guy before Bruce, the guy that the ceremony was actually for, uh, but not for Bruce. Um, from that moment on, he is publicly a man. So he went from adolescent to adult in that time. Um, he's then able to marry, he's able to own cattle, um, and everybody knows that. And I think you look at the confusion within our society now about growing up and go to a you know, city centre of a Saturday night and look at the lost generation of people, that kids that have had to grow up too soon or adults that still haven't grown up. Um, and I'm not advocating that we all go out and, you know, hurdle heifers in the field next door, but I think that there's something of this, the loss of ritual within our society um, that has been very, very damaging. And it's another thing, I think, that we can take um, from the tribal world. Um, the Omo Valley is about to change, like everywhere we visited on tribe, is about to, to change beyond recognition again, and that the, the authorities, the Ethiopian authorities, um, want to educate the tribes. They want to stamp out some of these rituals and also stop the sort of, the, there's, there's a cycle of revenge killings against, you know, um, as, as the, the tribes battle it out. And they're also building a um, huge hydroelectric plant, three dams upriver, which will essentially stop the flood cycle of the Omo, on which these people's um, agriculture relies. So, you know, I don't know what the future holds for, 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 for kids like this in the Omo Valley. Um, as we got through Series 2 uh, and into Series 3 of Tribe, um, 
we started to, I guess, feel more, comp co more confident in the stories that we wanted to tell and also to feel uh, an obligation to tell um, the sort of the real stories about indigenous peoples, really, which is not, it's not jackass in the jungle and it's not all fun and games. It's actually a story of marginalization, of diminishing habitats and of human rights abuses and lots of stuff that, you know, television sort of doesn't like because it doesn't really rate. Um, but having spent, uh, you know, what, 15, 15 films in tribal communities, you know, Bruce especially was adamant that these are the stories that we needed to do. So we sort of set off in series three with this in mind. And one of the places that we went to visit um, in order to tell this story was um, um, Borneo, uh, to visit the Penan people that you can see here. Now, the Penan live in the Malaysian province of uh, Sarawak, and traditionally they were nomadic hunter-gatherers, um, and increasingly they're being forced into settlement camps as great logging concessions move into their land, chop down their primary rainforest, um, and turn it into palm oil plantations. Um, there's about two or 300 nomadic Penan left, so still living their traditional lives, and they're sort of amazing people in that, um, they own nothing that they can't carry on their backs. They live in small, sort of three or four family groups that move through the forest, uh, carve out a little settlement from trees and tarpaulins that they've got, um, stay there for a couple of weeks until the game's hunted out, and then they move on again. So it's the very, it's a sort of definition of sustainability. They sort of leave nothing, and they take nothing that they can't eat or carry. Um, they have no agriculture. They don't grow crops. Um, they won't keep domesticated animals other than for pets and, and for eggs. They won't, um, they won't kill a domesticated animal because they say, if you've had a relationship with something, you've got to know it. How could you eat it, man? It's obscene. Um, and they were this very, sort of very, very beautiful, gentle culture. Um, but of all the people we went to live, I think they were the people who were under most threat. Um, so that's what the forest looks like once the logging camps have been through. Um, and I think Bruce and a small crew had been there for a couple of weeks when um, they got a visitation. Some guys, old Penan guys, turned up out of the forest and it was sort of like ghosts from the past arriving um, to plead with Bruce. And this, this clip sort of shows that. <laughs> All my life I've dreamt about meeting the original forest people of Borneo and the sudden unannounced arrival of some old traditional looking Penang was like a visitation from the past. And they had walked all day just to meet me. Inu pelun para temui dah putar, 
na kinatawa kikipuan ko. Yun ang tayong ginito ko. Um, so, I'm not sure that we had any good answers for them, really. What do you say to, to people who are the last of their kind, that we needed your forest to make our patio furniture, or that you know, we needed palm oil for our shampoo? Um, and I, so if you're just sort of faced with that emotional plea, it's hard to know, I mean, what, what do you do, you know? Um, and I guess the one thing that we perhaps could do is to learn some of the lessons from this tribal world about sustainability and about we're living within your means, which it feels um, we could really do with learning at the moment. Um, and I don't want to patronise or sentimentalise or romanticise these people's lives. Um, they live very, very tough lives. They're often very brutal lives and their children die of, of diseases that are easily preventable in the West. And, you know, they need to adapt to their changing circumstances like any, any human community. Um, but I think there are things that we can learn, and they're, things, they're very, very simple things. They're not specific to tribal communities. They're just sort of good common sense practices that have developed over generations and generations of people living. We seem to have forgotten them. Um, and they're things like we could lead smaller, less gluttonous lives. Um, we could think more, shop less, um, consume less, think about where our stuff comes from and where our waste goes to. These are things that if you live within a 10 mile radius, you know that if you foul your stream, someone's going to get sick. We don't do that anymore. We've forgotten what happens. Um, we could remember that money doesn't make us happy. It just creates rich and poor and divides us. Um, what makes us happy is to lead fulfilling lives full of loving relationships. Um, we could respect our environment um, and the other animals that we share it with. We could cherish our children and respect our elders and learn from the both of them. Um, and we could learn that giving is usually better than taking and that um, sharing sort of works for both parties, really. Um, we're consuming our world at a really astonishing rate and it has a direct effect on these people and will have a direct effect on us. Uh, we just haven't seen it quite yet. Um, we're losing languages and cultures and species at astonishing speed. Um, It'll all be gone before we, before we know. These people's world will have vanished around them. Um, and it'll be too late for us to learn their lessons. So I think if we could heed some of this traditional tribal knowledge before it's too late, it would, um, it would be a good thing for us all. So thanks very much. <laughs>